What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with President Cecil and Sister Sharon Samuelson was given January 5th, 2010. We're pleased this morning to have the opportunity to hear from President and Sister Samuelson. If you've attended past devotionals at which they've spoken, you will already be familiar with their basic biographical information. You will know, for example, that Sister Samuelson graduated with honors in history from the University of Utah, then taught school to help her husband through his early years of medical school until she became a full-time homemaker and mother to their five children. You will also know that she enjoys reading, cooking, and playing tennis. Most of you will also already know that President Samuelson completed his formal medical education at the University of Utah and Duke University, and that he then served at the University of Utah as a professor of medicine, dean of the School of Medicine, and vice president of health sciences. You will also know that he was called to the Quorum of the Seventy in 1994, and that when he received his current assignment as the 12th president of Brigham Young University in 2003, he was serving as one of the presidents of the Seventy. What I have come to learn in the past year and a half that I've had the opportunity to associate with them is that both President and Sister Samuelson have a keen sense of humor and a gift for making any person, from the highest of governmental officials to the most humble child, feel comfortable in any situation. Those two gifts require knowing a lot about a lot of things. It also requires a great love for people. It is telling in that regard that while they both have several impressive titles, one of their favorites is Grandpa and Grandma one invoked with enthusiasm by their 12 grandchildren. Each of them also has other lesser known but equally impressive talents and interests. As those of you who have sat by her in athletic events know, Sister Samuelson is an avid and incredibly knowledgeable BYU sports fan, one who usually knows, for example, the names and key statistics of all the members of both the men's and the women's basketball team, information that many of the most ardent Cougar United members could not provide. As for the President, he is a very gifted and energetic craftsman. While I take pride in the fact that I can change the light bulbs and furnace filters in my house, President Samuelson literally built his house. In his spare time, while serving in a state presidency and working as a physician and faculty member at the School of Medicine, writing articles such as one in the Journal of Clinical Investigation entitled Hematologic and Serologic Studies in Six SAI Arthritis. 6-SAI arthritis actually has a longer name that I can't even pronounce. As I said, they both know a lot about a lot of things. Most important of all, both President and Sister Samuelson have a deep understanding and unwavering testimonies of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a profound love for young people, especially those at BYU. We are blessed to have them leading this university, and now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from President and Sister Samuelson. Good morning. It is indeed a privilege to stand before this assembly and welcome each one of you back on campus to begin the 2010 school year. My heart is full of gratitude for the opportunity I have to associate with such an amazing group of young men and women here at Brigham Young University. Each of you is representative of a generation of young men and women who will, in the near future, go out into the world and do great and marvelous things some within the public scrutiny and some more private and personal. You will eventually be found throughout the world because, indeed, the world will be your campus. To quote from that well-known author, Dr. Seuss, who, without being aware of it, describes you when he states, Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. Wherever you fly, you'll be best of the best. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. There is a scripture found in Revelation 3.8, and it reads, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. The Lord has promised each one of you that He will open doors for you to enter and be a beacon of light to follow, if you but serve Him. 
He will make available opportunities and experiences which can help you be successful in both the secular and temporal areas of your life. When you seek and listen to the Spirit and follow the promptings of the Holy Ghost, many blessings will be forthcoming. Prospects for expanding your horizons and many of life's experiences are boundless if you enter the doors which the Lord provides for you, commensurate with your faith. In fact, He has said that these doors cannot be shut by man, but you can close them yourself if you shut Him out of your life. At the present time, you are students studying to achieve important goals in your lives. You desire to gain an education which hopefully will enable you to be successful in future professional and personal endeavors. In the months and years ahead, you will be entering doors which will lead you to places and offer you opportunities you may not imagine at the present time. As you make your way on the pathways of life, there will be many of these doors available to you. There will be times in your future when the door you enter may take you on a road which may be strewn with pain, heartache, and suffering, and you would choose not to take it if that choice were possible. Individual struggles, however, are necessary for your eternal progression. These trials test your faith, endurance, and submission to the will of the, God, the Lord and are part of God's plan for you. Also, it is so essential that you always recognize and acknowledge the source of all the blessings you receive and act accordingly. In 1 Timothy 4.12, you are admonished as a youthful generation to be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. When was the last time you read or recited the Thirteen Articles of Faith? All but one of them begin with the words, I believe. Therefore, it certainly would be a good reminder to you of what we as members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints profess to believe if you would do so. You live in a world where conditions economically, politically, and socially can be extremely dark and depressing without the hope and knowledge of Christ's mission and message. To this world and its people, you are needed to be an example in all you do of the beliefs stated in this body of Scripture. Those who observe your lifestyle and behavior learn a great deal about your character, faith, and values. <clears throat> Excuse me. They can be inspired by your example if you follow the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is possible, however, for the opposite to occur if your words and actions are not consistent with the principles and teachings of the gospel. <clears throat> president David O. McKay was the president of the Church during my high school and college years, just as Presidents Gordon B. Hinckley and Thomas S. Monson will be the ones whom you will recall as influence you during these same tender years in your lives. President McKay is the one I admired, loved, and strived to heed his counsel. When I entered the Missionary Training Center in Provo periodically, I am reminded of him when I view the replica of a stone which is on display in the main entrance. The inscription on the stone influenced President McKay throughout his whole life. The message came at a time when President McKay was serving his first mission in Scotland, and he was very discouraged and downhearted. He had just received a rebuke from a Scottish woman to whom he had presented a tract. The prejudice and misconceptions he felt the people had toward him and the Church hurt him very deeply. As he departed from the Scottish town of Stirling after touring its historic castle on the same day, he had the following life-altering experience. As we were coming back into town, I saw on my right an unfinished dwelling over the front door of which there was some carving. That was most unusual, so I said to Elder Johnston, I'm going to see what that is. I was halfway up the graveled walk when there came to my eyesight a striking motto carved in stone, Whate'er thou art, act well thy part. I repeated it to Elder Johnston as we walked into town to find a place for our lodgings before we began our work. We walked quietly, but I said to myself, or the spirit within me whispered, You are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
More than that, you are a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. You accepted the responsibility as a representative of the church. I accepted the message given to me on that stone, and from that moment we tried to do our part as missionaries in Scotland. President McKay spoke often of this experience and how powerful and influential the message on the stone was to him and how it became an important guideline throughout his life. In fact, Francis Gibbons in his biography of President McKay stated, there can be no doubt that his experience, which planted the motto on his mind under such unusual circumstances, was one of the major factors in the growth and development of David O. McKay. President McKay, of course, also reiterated that the message applied to moral and lawful endeavors and not to harmful or villainous actions. Today it reminds, remains a reminder to us of the scripture found in Mosiah 18.9, where we are admonished to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places. As my husband and I were raising our family, we jokingly, but very seriously, would say to our children periodically as they left the house for various reasons, remember who you are and what you represent. We were reminding them that they were a son or daughter of Heavenly Father and that their behavior in every word and action was representative of their family, church, and God. Presently, you have different roles in your lives. These roles often change from day to day or even hour to hour. As mentioned previously, each of you is a student at Brigham Young University who is striving to be successful in every aspect of that role. Hopefully, you will periodically recall the motto of President McKay and remember to act well by part in your day-to-day -day activities. You can be found learning in the classrooms, studying in the library or cafeterias, walking on campus, working at jobs on or off campus, attending sporting events in different venues on this campus or away, driving motorized vehicles, socializing with friends and classmates, or attending your church meetings. I could, of course, continue with a much more extensive list. Hopefully, as a student here, you understand and are an example of the motto, Whate'er thou art, act well thy part. The Lord has opened a door for you to attend BYU with its attendant blessings, challenges, expectations, and experiences. At the doorway to this campus, you are reminded to enter to learn, go forth to serve. He would have each of you remember who you are and how much he loves you as one of his spiritual sons or daughters. He would have you serve your fellow men, benefiting them and making this world better for your having lived in it. Your lives will continue with new roles as you leave campus life. You will find yourselves having different ones in your families. You will serve in many different capacities and assignments in the church. You will be leaders as well as followers. In the workplace and home, you will create, teach, learn, serve, and so forth. You will have vitally important roles in your community, family, and church. Throughout your life, you will have opportunities each day to be reminded of the admonition that was followed by a prophet of the Lord. Whate'er thou art, act well thy part. I have a testimony that the Lord lives and that we will be blessed as we enter the righteous doors He will provide for us if we but serve Him. I am thankful for our prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, to guide, teach, and counsel us. May we all be examples of the believers and act well our parts is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome back as we begin another semester at the start of a brand new year. For me, these new years are coming very quickly, but my enthusiasm for them hasn't lessened. My optimism, particularly for you, is enhanced, and I look forward to an exciting semester that will include lots of hard work, quite a bit of fun, faith-enhancing experiences, and deepening special friendships and relationships. It is a great blessing in my life to be with you at this remarkable place in this important time, and Sister Samuelson and I do love you. Occasionally, I'm asked by students and others if I get a chance to see the President of the Church very often. 
I respond that I do see the prophet fairly regularly. In my current assignment, I am in meetings at least two times each month with him and on occasion more frequently. I have had various interactions with President Monson over several years and have always been uplifted by his teaching, his kindness, and his support. I have learned that it doesn't take prolonged exposure to benefit from his counsel and concern. I have also learned that few, if any, of even the smallest details escape his attention. For example, he quickly observed and has never forgotten that I am left-handed. His reputation for the concern for the one, particularly the widow or the wounded, the poor or the persecuted, is widely known. Perhaps you would also like to know, if you don't already, that he is also very interested and concerned about students. He continues to be most supportive of BYU and is particularly demonstrative when it comes to students. Even in these difficult times, he wants you to be well housed, and shortly you will see the tangible results of his desire for more and better student housing on campus. I could say much more about our beloved prophet, but we will forbear for now. When President Monson gave his most recent BYU devotional address on September 15, 2009, a thought crossed my mind about what I might say to you today. You remember that he reviewed lessons learned and principles taught by all the Presidents of the Church whom he has known from Heber J. Grant to Gordon B. Hinckley. When he mentioned his experiences with President David O. McKay, who called President Monson to be an apostle in September of 1963, I remembered some marvelous but limited exposure that I had and experienced with this extraordinary prophet of my youth. As President Monson mentioned how considerate President McKay was of everyone, I recalled my own personal witness of that positive characteristic of the prophet. Although very different from President Monson's close, frequent, and intimate association, my memories of President McKay have been very meaningful to me, even though at a much greater distance. Because I am sure he would have treated all of you just as he did me if you had been in my shoes, I would like you to understand that those of us who had the chance to interact with him personally were, in a real sense, just proxies for everyone else. The same is the case today with President Monson. Whenever I see him, I recognize that I am representing you. When I was about your age, I had a few brief interactions with President David O. McKay, and I thought it might be instructive and interesting to share some experiences that are very poignant, at least to me. At the outset, I must be clear that we were not close in the typical sense. In fact, on the few occasions when I met him personally, I always had to tell him my name because he would have had no reason to otherwise know it or remember or ever uh, think of seeing me. Like many of you with President Monson, I knew him, but he didn't know me, except as he knew everyone he had the opportunity to meet. I believe we as members of the Church always have tender feelings about the prophet, <clears throat> but with our family it was particularly so with President McKay. He was not only the prophet and president of the Church, but he was a dear friend of many years to my maternal grandparents. Although President McKay was 13 years younger than my grandfather Mitchell, they were called at the same time to serve as missionaries together in Scotland. They associated with one another frequently during their missions and continued their friendship throughout the years. President McKay spoke at my grandfather's funeral and also married and sealed my parents and some of my mother's siblings and companions in the Salt Lake Temple. I was in the presence of President McKay on at least two or three occasions in my youth. One such opportunity occurred when I was a teenager, and he dedicated our new ward meeting house. Although we didn't know each other at the time, I was interested to learn later that Dr. Kim B. Clark, the current president of BYU-Idaho, was also in that dedicatory service as a member of the other ward meeting in the same chapel. My first conversation with President McKay happened when I was 19 years old. I had received a mission call and was attending the mission home, the predecessor to the MTC in Salt Lake City near Church headquarters. In those days, the missionaries in training ate their meals at the Hotel Utah, which is now the Joseph Smith Building on South Temple and Main Streets in Salt Lake City. In the basement of the Hotel Utah was a barber shop, and after lunch one day, my companion and I passed the barber shop door and saw President McKay having his hair cut. We also saw that there did not appear to be a back door to the establishment, so we decided to wait until he came out to try to shake his hand. While we waited, about a dozen more missionaries came by and saw what we did, and so they also waited. 
When the prophet finished with the barber, out he came. He went from one missionary to another, shaking hands, smiling, and asked each one a question or two about their names, hometowns, and missions. He was able to connect someone or something he knew with each missionary, and everyone felt a special relationship with the president of the church. I was the last in line. Because my surname is different from my mother's maiden name, I had been instructed to tell President McKay, if I ever met him, that I was the grandson of Joseph Mitchell, which I did. He dropped my hand and hugged me with both arms. He then told all the missionaries that my grandfather had taught him how to be a missionary. I don't know whether this was an exaggeration or not, but I know how it made me feel. He then asked me which mission I had been called. With some pride, I told him the North British mission because I knew that Scotland was included in the mission and it was also where he and my grandfather had served together. President McKay said something to me which I thought was quite unusual. He mentioned that in the near future, the Brethren planned to divide the North British mission and he instructed me to tell President Brockbank, the mission president, that I was to serve in Scotland. I didn't think you were supposed to tell the mission president anything. <laughs> Several days later, I found myself at the mission headquarters in Manchester, England, and with the other new missionaries. I had a brief two- or three-minute interview with the mission president, and before I knew it or had any idea how to raise the issue, I was whisked out the door and the next new elder came into the room. I thought that surely I'd have another opportunity to fulfill my charge, but I still didn't have any idea as to how to present the matter. As I waited with the others, the secretary to the president came out and informed the group that she had been instructed to give us the assignments to our new areas. She did this alphabetically. In the first nine or ten assignments announced, only one elder was assigned to Scotland, and my spirit sank lower and lower. It was not that I objected to serving in England, which I would otherwise welcomed, but I had been given only one specific instruction by the prophet in my whole life, and I had muffed it. <laughs> when my name and assignment were finally announced, <clears throat> I learned with great relief that I had been assigned to the Kirkati district in Scotland. That night, as I said my prayers, I committed to Heavenly Father that if the president of the Church ever again gave me a specific assignment, I would do whatever the cost. With all of my imperfections in this one thing, I think I have been fully faithful. Sometime later, after the mission was divided, President McKay came to Scotland, and all the missionaries serving in Scotland at that time, I think approximately 40 in number, had the privilege of being taught by him in person for several hours. Time does not permit an account of the impressiveness of this master teacher except for one very remarkable episode. During this time, the new mission was being established, and we met with considerable opposition and some hostility. As President McKay was teaching us, a small phalanx of newspaper reporters barged right into the room and confronted the prophet. I think most of us young men felt disposed to physically remove the intruders, but President McKay motioned for us to remain seated and in a direct but kindly way answered their question as to whether or not he was really a prophet. He responded by asking the reporters a question that caused them to bow their heads and withdraw from the room without further comment. He simply and quietly said, Look me in the eyes. Can you tell me that I am not a prophet? It was a tremendous moment in my life because I knew then better than ever before that he truly was the Lord's prophet, and we as young, inexperienced, and unpolished missionaries were really on the Lord's errand. In August of 1962, President McKay visited our mission yet once again to organize the first stake in Scotland, the Glasgow Scotland Stake. He was accompanied by other general authorities and it was a Pentecostal experience for all of us in attendance. I don't remember many of the specifics that he taught, but I do remember with electricity that persists to this day one statement he made. He was reviewing the challenges and difficulties of his first mission in Scotland some 65 years before. He told of the few but faithful saints, their sacrifices and struggles that they had all experienced, and his great affection and respect for the missionaries with whom he had served. At that time, he was in his late eighties, and he mused that all of his brethren save himself were on the other side of the veil. However, he felt the presence in our meeting of three whose names he mentioned. One name he expressed was that of my grandfather. 
To make sure that I had heard correctly, I later looked for the text of his speech, which was published shortly thereafter in the Church News, and sure enough, there was the name of Brother Mitchell. Now, you might not think any of these experiences to be particularly impressive, but to me, they have had a very profound influence on my life that persists to this day. I am grateful for them, and especially for the lessons learned and the principles taught by this great prophet. Over the years, I have read and reread virtually all of his general conference talks, his books, and other messages. I very much enjoy his quoting of Robert Burns and other classic poets, and also his insightful ways of teaching and explaining the restored gospel. However, and this might seem surprising to you and probably would be to him as well, as impressive as his formal teaching and ministry were, my brief personal encounters have taught me some very important lessons which have become dear to me. What are they? Let me list a few in the remaining moments that we have this morning. First, as mentioned by President Monson last September, was his consideration for others. He was a gentleman in every respect, but beyond that, he also made extra effort to connect with and relate to everyone he met. I frequently think of him taking time to shake the hands and encourage that group of young missionaries of which I was a part. There are many accounts, including some related by President Monson, of his concern and feelings of others. Second, his loyalty to his friends and his associates. I think it mattered not to President McKay that his friend Joseph Mitchell was not highly educated in the schools of the world. In correspondence with my grandfather over the years and in his comments at Grandfather Mitchell's funeral, President McKay was unfailingly kind, complimentary, and appropriately affectionate. Third, his ability to be who he was so naturally and yet represent so effectively what he represented as the Lord's prophet caused him to be admired and loved by nearly everyone he met. He could give correction without offense and genuine encouragement as he taught. Fourth, his life gave regular and forceful evidence that he practiced what he preached. He was a perfect example, in my view, of one who wanted to be and knew that he was a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time anyone was around him, he or she went away determined to be better. Many of you who might have studied President McKay's life or ministry in detail would be able to add much more from the public record that I have mentioned. These reflections have been largely confined to my personal experiences and observations. Let me add just one more that I am convinced many of you share. That is the tremendous influence this servant of the Lord has had in so many obvious ways on our current President and Prophet Thomas S. Monson. I am sure President Monson's basic personality, commitment to the Savior, and orientation to service were fairly well established prior to his friendship and association with President McKay. Nevertheless, the impact of this prophet leader on his younger friend and colleague is unmistakable. In President Monson, we see the same tender consideration and feeling for others that President McKay demonstrated. President Monson is always interested in everyone he meets and makes special efforts to cause them to know of his genuine interest and concern. President Monson is unfailingly loyal to his friends and associates. This characteristic is seen not only in his relationships with his counselors, the Twelve, and others in his circle, but also includes the leaders of the Church in past years as well as the members of today. Likewise, his friendship and loyalty are not restricted to members of his family or his faith. While never compromising or equivocating on doctrine, principles, or revealed patterns of faith and conduct, he also unfailingly reaches out to those of different faith traditions or those with no faith at all. Certainly, he is loved by the Latter-day Saints, but he is also appreciated and honored by those of other churches and backgrounds because of his kindness, generosity, and genuine concern for all people. Like President McKay, President Monson has always tried to do not only what he needed to do, but to do what he felt he should as one called to represent the Savior. I don't think President McKay was ever a bishop, but President Monson was, and always cared for the widows, the youth, and his entire flock. After a season of service in that calling, he was released, but even to this day he continues to be concerned about, serve, and watch over those for whom he was bishop. I am most grateful for the lessons that these two great priesthood leaders have taught and are continuing to teach me. I am grateful that I can bear a solemn but happy witness that these men and all others who have held this highest office in the Lord's Church are true servants of our living Heavenly Father and His beloved Son, 
in the same calling and position with the same keys and authority of their predecessor, Joseph Smith. Might we all continue to learn from their examples and teachings and do our best to emulate them is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This BYU devotional address with President Cecil and Sister Sharon Samuelson was given January 5th, 2010.